So now we're talk, uh, we are going to talk about the uh, regularization and model selection, which is chapter three of the textbook. Um, well, we're going to talk about out of sample versus in sample performance of regressions and forecasting. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, regularization pass and uh, lasso regression out of sample experiments and then cross validation and then information criteria like AIC and BIC. All right, so uh, some basic facts about linear model is here. The model is always conditional expectation. On condition that you have data X, what is the expected value of Y, the response variable, okay? And then the structure of this, right, the relation, is formulated as a functional form f over here um, and then let me change this color like this right f and gaussian regression we use linear regression x b is a linear combination right and whereas binomial regression you have logistic regression like this which is a probability model right um, like this part part and then um, we were computing those likelihood when it comes to logistic regression. Um, linear regression, Gauss re regression, we had OLS or ordinary least squares uh, approach, right? And then there, there's a residual. Some of these residual a deviation was important. And then here in binomial setting or uh, there we have the terminology called the deviance, which is equivalent to uh, these difference, you know, residual kind of concept. Um, and then likelihood is defined as this one, probability of, uh, conditional probability of having Y1 given X1 data observation, and then probability of having response Y2 given, you have data of X2, and blah, 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 until nth observation. So you cross multiply all these things and then these probabilities. You think about this probability mass, right? They are probabilities between zero and one. And if you multiply what is between zero and one, the magnitude of it will shrink down, shrink down, shrink down, right? Um, very small, tiny number, you will see it, but um, because of that concern of very small, tiny magnitude number, what do we do? We take the log of it. There comes the logarithm defect because it expands the, uh, the difference between the small, tiny magnitude within uh, 0 and 1. And the deviance is proportional to minus log likelihood. Okay, minus over here. Why minus? Well, because if you look at the log function, okay, here's x and here's y, and y equals log of y, a log of x, that graph looks like this. It crosses at one and uh, never reaches zero, okay, and then any small tiny number that you calculate with this likelihood uh, multiplication, right? You will have log of these guys over here. So that small tiny difference will be magnified, that difference. Make sense? So that's the property of log that we are, uh, we are, um, how do you say? Uh, taking advantage, right? And this is, you know, also uniform transformation. Uniform means like what is small, okay, or lower number, okay, lower, and then the higher number, somewhere here, results in lower over here and higher number. So order of lowness and highness does not change. It's uniform, okay? What is big is supposed to be big after transformation. So that's uniform transformation. Anyway, so that's where we use this log likelihood. And then beta hat is commonly uh, 
uh, fit to maximize uh, likelihood. Uh, and then by maximizing the likelihood, you are minimizing the deviance, right? Least squares approach, least squares regression is the same idea. Minimize that, uh, minimize that square distance between the predicted value and then the actual value, the residual, okay? Fit is summarized by R squared, which is 1 minus de deviance of beta hat over deviance of null case, which is beta equals zero, all the way down. Um, the only R squared we ever really care about is out of sample R squared. Okay, what does this mean? Well, you run a regression using a present data, okay? That's in sample regression. But for the purpose of machine learning and then data science, what matters is how much would you be able to predict the future? What has not happened, right? Um, not necessarily future, but what data that is not covered, not covered in the beta estimation process, okay, not covered, something new, okay? So this out of sample, okay? Out of sample predictability matters. That's what we are talking about. Um, R squared is always um, in this form, one minus deviance over deviance like this. The difference between in and out of sample R squared is what data are used to fit beta hat and what the deviants are calculated on. For in sample R squared, we have data x1 and y1 all the way down to xn and yn. You, and you use, the, uh, use this data to fit beta hat. The deviance is then, say for a linear regression, um, the residual, okay, residual, squared, squared residual and summation of it. That's what we call deviance, okay? Uh, least squares, we want to minimize this guy later. And out of sample R squared observations, one through N are still used to fit beta hat, but the deviance is now calculated over new observations. Say, um, I, okay, is important. In the in sample over here, right, we used i equals 1, the observation number 1, all the way down to n. And then out of sample, well, you start with n plus 1, the next one, plus n plus m, all the way down to n plus m, okay? The future point, or something not within that data set, the sample that we estimated the beta. Okay, outside of it. So that's why we have n plus 1 and n plus m over here. The other things are identical, okay? The only difference. So you see that out of sample deviance concern. You want to minimize this guy, okay? You remember r squared, okay? r squared and adjusted r squared, it's all about in sample thing. Whereas this one, the deviance of beta I had out of sample, is about something out of sample, something not in the beta estimation. Okay, the textbook author brings a data set called the semiconductor manufacturing process, and there, uh, semiconductor failure is an issue. And when it comes to semiconductor, you are in the right country because this is South Korea, which is Republic of Semiconductor, R-O-S. Republic of Semiconductor. I'm not kidding. Why? Because the biggest uh, company in South Korea is Samsung Electronics, which is semiconductor company. Their breadwinner business is semiconductor. And number two biggest company in Korea is what? SK Hynix, which is again semiconductor company, right? The market cap of these two companies take up more than 30% of the whole Korean stock market, okay? Out of almost like a 2,000 companies, only two take up more than 30% of market cap. That's what we call a market, uh, the, the Republic of Semiconductor. Um, so Semiconductor, well, just to give you some pictures of it, well, uh, all that I'm trying to say it is, is that it has a very complicated and long and repetitive procedure to produce the chips, okay? And then what you see on the left-hand side is something called wafer, 
and then what you see on the middle is the memory chip by, uh, produced by uh, Samsung Electronics, 8 gigabytes DDR DRAM or something like that, dynamic random access memory. This is the breadwinner of South Korea. And then um, this is how you install your stick in your memory RAM onto your desktop computer, right? Got it, and then just uh, stick it in two slots over there, eight gigabytes, two of them, 16 gig gigabytes RAM upgrade. You can do that, right? Um, how expensive is it? Well, depending on the price of it, those, those chips, the, uh, the stock price of uh, Samsung Electronics and Kospi index fluctuates like crazy. Okay, uh, and then where do you see this kind of memory, uh, memory card is sticking in? Well, if you open up your uh, desktop computer like mine over here, uh, which is uh, Alienware, right? Um, there is some places over there in the motherboard anyway. By the way, semiconductor chip producing, we are talking about this individual chip over here. Individual chip, individual chip, okay? And where does this come from? Well, it comes from one small tiny piece from the wafer. The wafer is a whole bunch of silicons, right? Silicon coming from your sands and rocks and those kind of things, silicon. And then, how do they produce this thing? Well, um, as it turns out, it looks like this. The process is like this. You start with a silicon wafer, blank one, and then what do you do? Well, it goes through 200 different cycles, 250 times or something like that, okay? Uh, you want to imprint some kind of a circuit, electric circuit, upon that silicon wafer, okay? It's not like writing with your pencil on there, right? Um, but what do you do? Um, spread a chemical first on that wafer, and this chemical, what is it supposed to do? Well, it's, it's, it's light sensitive, right? 물질, right? Light sensitive. So much so that you spread your chemical and then take some photos, right? Take pictures, expose this chemical with silicon, expose it to strong light so that some part of the chemicals responding to lights will, how do you say, will be affected and then it may, you know, uh, be washed away and the other part will remain within that silicon layer, okay? So that uh, afterwards you wash those chemical away and then those remaining chemicals will become a circuit, okay? We are imprinting this kind of circuits on this silicon, okay? That's the process, one time, one round, but that's not the end, okay? 250 different times you run it, okay? So that you will have a layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of circuits within that small tiny well, small tiny chip okay on the huge wafer okay how many chips would there be on a single wafer well it depends on the size of the wafer and the size of the chip right 720 or 1400 different ones all right so you using one wafer you run this kind of 200 plus round of uh, photo, photo kind of uh, synthesis? No, not a photosynthesis, but this kind of uh, um, photo resist, and then this kind of procedure, 식각공정, uh, photo resistry, uh, re uh, resistant, and then all these kind of things, right? So this is the procedure that I just uh, show you. I, it's not going to come in your exam. No, don't worry about it. But just to give you some idea about the core industry of South Korea. This is where your bread is coming from, that's why. Okay, um, yeah, wafer. Yeah, before you do this kind of things, you cut the wafer into slices. Wehas wafers, right? The cookie wehas is like a wafer, small. Anyway, the thing is, it is very much error prone. Error prone, there's a problem here. Okay, 
Uh, those chemicals are light sensitive. And then if you, I mean, also you don't want any dust to land on that piece of chip. Okay. Think about those fine dust that you have, uh, that we see in these hemanji, all these kind of things, right? Those particle of dust should never be able to land on this wafer at all. So that's why these guys are wearing those uh, bangjinbok, or like a uh, dust resisting kind of clothes. That looks like what? Astronom, uh, astronomical, right? I don't know. Astronauts, right? Um, so that's a very difficult procedure and very expensive. So before going to that factory, you have to wipe off all those dust. That's a hard part. Whenever a dust lands on any chip, that's a defect. <coughs> Throw away. So when I visited Samsung Electronics uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturing plant like 20 years ago, right? Um, they gave me a souvenir of cuffs button and the necktie pin that is made of this uh, defect chip, okay? Defected, why? Because they had happened to have some particles landed upon it. So they cannot use it. So instead it is beautiful, like a colorful. So why don't, why don't we use it as a souvenir? Okay, so I just got that one, okay? A uh, very cherishable one. Uh, anyway, the thing is, uh, besides this particle, okay, there are a lot of ways that can ruin this semiconductor. For example, cutting it. Okay, imagine this, right? Um, after all those kind of complicated procedure, you have to... Uh, cut it into pieces and there you can cut wrongly okay Ooh, one millimeter away that's it and then you have to package it into that plastic chip that has a, a lot of leg like centipede like this right on that process you can have some defects of course all those rounds of photosynthesis or something right um, prone to errors right you never know where when the defect will happen and the yield the percentage of yield which is um, out of a hundred chips in that silicon wafer how much what percentage survives so that it is non-defect we call it yield and yield is a very key pr uh, metric when you analyze this kind of semiconductor company, when you talk to equity analysts, they will talk about this yield rate, okay? All this kind of technology is what those guys in the engineering department are worrying about, okay? Anyway, they do the testing and then identify those defects, okay? So the data is about this kind of defect or not of semiconductor chips, each and every chip, okay? A uh, long introduction of the data set, but uh, it's worth, invest, uh, worth doing it. Very complicated operation, and then the little margin for error, the textbook author just uh, uh, gives this wonderful data. Uh, and then hundreds of diagnostics. Is it useful or delimitating is an issue. Um, and then we want to focus reporting and better predict failures. So what is a procedure that is more likely to uh, give a defect okay okay so we want to tackle those guys and then cure so that the procedure will be safer okay um, so here X is 200 input signals at different points of procedure they will check it right and then get the signal that whether this chip is okay or not not just okay or not but all kinds of chemicals, how much did we spread into this chemical versus not, and then how much of a strong light or weaker light did we give, right? There will be some variations in it, right? And packaging, all these kind of things. Um, you can measure, right? You can measure those strengths in that processes. And those are X's, right? You can uh, uh, check those signals and then see whether these signals can predict the semiconductor chip failure, okay? Why as 100 out of uh, 1,500 failures will be there? Uh, logistic regression for failure of chips, 
will look like this and we're going to run a regression. All right, so semiconductor data set. It's just like semiconductor failure is just like a what? Um, bankruptcy kind of thing. So instead of chips, you can think of a failure of the company, right? Instead of, uh, you know, uh, failure of chips, right? So let's do it, right? Clear all those data set in the memory and then import semiconductor.csv a summary and it shows me a whole bunch of 200 different uh, uh, variables showing up over here like this, okay? Um, then the full model uh, of uh, regression will look like this, GLM and then the failure, okay? Fail is your dependent variable and then we want to throw in all the variables as right-hand side variable, as a pure data science uh, approach, right? So it gives me like crazy regression results like this, 200 different coefficients in, uh, plus in, uh, intercept over there, right? Um, all these kind of things. And then uh, I want to keep this regression coefficients and the results into a full um, matrix over here, full matrix, okay? Um, and then show the result of full, and then there I want to compute the, uh, what is that? The deviance measure, right? One minus, right? Um, full deviance, um, right? based on the regression model, right, the deviance divided by null hypothesis-based deviance is total sum of squared. You can think about it that way. Total variation out of it, how much is not explained, okay, by this regression. It was kind of a residual or dev deviance. And then take the portion out of 100%. That's 56% explained by the regression model. Wow. The failure of semiconductor is predicted uh, very well in 56% of it is explained by this uh, model of all variables over there. Wow, sounds good. But remember that's in sample regression. And then uh, I'm going to create a matrix called results over there. Oh, there's a vector, right? And then vector of coefficients would be there. And then I want to see all the coefficients and p-values. You can think of it like this, all right? What do you see? Well, all those signals and then estimates of the slope and then z-statistic and p-value are there, right? And then rig results will show you the same thing anyway. And coefficients, um, we're going to create a matrix like that, coefficients which is, again, the same thing, right, in a matrix form. And then I'm going, I want to export this guy into Excel format, yeah, by this command, right? You can check out in your Excel. And then, um, then I want to draw a histogram of p-values, right? We had 200 different explanatory variables in our regression, 200, okay, 200. Now, you will have a lot of p-values, 200 p-values, and we want to see the histogram of p-values. You want more significant, okay, explanatory variables than not, whose p-value will be very, very low, uh, perhaps, you know, below uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.05 or something. And as you see the histogram over here, that's this guy, okay? But interestingly, there are a lot of guys whose p-value is bigger, which is garbages, right? So uh, what do we do? Well, FDR comes in, fail, uh, what's, what's that? Uh, false discovery rate, okay? So th this is how we compute the false discovery rate, okay? And then at 10% FDR, we get 25 significant predictors or the variables right-hand side, side variables, okay? And then I draw the um, Benjamini-Hochberg algorithm-based graph like this. 
the order of p value the smallest p valued ones whose p value is dotted over here second the uh, smallest uh, uh, what's that uh, p value ones whose p value is dotted over here third fourth fifth okay six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirty blah blah blah, blah, blah. and then 25 of them is kept and then the uh what is it the uh, uh, line those 25 of them happen to li uh, line up below this uh, Benjamin Hochberg's algorithm based line okay so this will be our cutoff uh, in that uh, sense right you look at this p-value over here which is like a, a 0 0.001 or something like that 1% or less right that will be our cutoff p-value okay FDR p-value oh yeah yeah 0, 0.0 one two one seven so so p value of uh, 0 0.01217 is our critical value okay uh for this model okay um and some of you may wonder well what's the scale of it over here on the right hand side this is log scale that's why you see more sparse distribution over here more condensed one uh and then 20 and 200 they are 10 times difference but they are in the uh, same look. Uh, the distance is the same, right? Um, and then we move down. Rerun a cut regression using only the, these 25. So forget about the rest of them. Okay, let's run this regression with this supposedly important variables, right? Uh, whose p-value is less than one, 0 0.1217 or 0 0.122 over here okay and then we call them significant variables and then we're going to run a regression of failure based on this data of sc the same sc but um here the names of it should be in the significance set over there all right um if you run it the uh what is that 1 over, right, the deviance of the model relative to um, total deviance is now what? 18%. Remember, 53% was the one, okay, in sample and then full model or everything included. Over here, it is again in sample, in sample, right, not out of sample yet, but in sample. And then with this 25 um, important variables if we predict the failure of a semiconductor um, it's 18 percent it got worse i know but we are we th uh, threw out uh, those garbage variables that's why um, and then and then so here uh, we're going to get back over here and then a cut model we call it the cut model cut into the ones with if uh, that passes uh, Benjamin uh, Hochberg uh, algorithm, right? Um, those 25 variables regression, the uh, R squared is 18%. Okay. Now, now, um, this is much smaller than the full model, 56%. In sample, uh, R squared is always increases with more covariates. This is exactly, uh, covariate means the variable on your right hand side. And exactly what MLE beta hat is fit to maximize. But how well okay, does each model predict new data is a valid question. An out of sample experiment is needed. So out of sample, how would you do that? Well, uh, fold it. Fold it, what do you mean? Chopper? right chaba like a fold it okay so that here is the sample here is the sample that you're going to run regression with and then estimate beta okay based on this uh observation and then est once estimating that beta we'll bring that beta into this folded set over here smaller one and then run it because this is out of sample if this is part is out of sample that part is in sample right so that's the approach over here fold it um how many times okay what's the what should be the proportion well it's up to you 
well, split the data into 10 random subsets, fold, do 10 times fit model beta hat using only 9 tenths of data and record R squared on the left out subset. Um, these out of sample R squared give us a sense of how well each model can predict data that is not already seen, okay? Um, so the full model R squared, okay, uh, we, well, out of, uh, the out of sample experiment for semiconductor failure, we gain uh, predictive accuracy by dropping variables, okay? Um, so here, let's see, let's see. Ta da Yes. Out of sample prediction example, first define the deviance and R squared function. The deviance will be like this. And then Gaussian family and um, yeah, run it with this function. And then get a null deviance too. Okay. All right, and then set up the experiment, okay? So n should be the number of observations, k should be the uh, 10, which is the number of folds, right? Um, fold ID will be assigned, okay? Uh, tenth, one tenth is folded, right? And then some variables, uh, some observations, right? Some observations belong to fold one, some two, three, four, five in random fashion. And then, um, and then each fold will have its IDs like this. And then create an empty data frame like this, OOS out of sample and the data frame like this. So OOS will look like this. Okay. And then, and then use a for loop to run the experiment like this. So K, that small k starts from one and goes to big k and 10 times, right? And it repeats itself like this. So fold ID is k that you start with one, right? Two, three, four, five, each ID. And then you create a training set, a train set. And then those, we call this set, uh, the folded ones, the bigger one, training set, and the other part, a test set. Okay, this part, test set, training set. So that's train, okay? Training set is the one that you estimate betas, beta hat, right? And then fit the two regressions like this, GLM and data set SC, subset of train. You see that? Based on this subset of train, you run a regression, binomial, which is logistic regression, and then get the result as full, okay? Full model because it is these guys. And then uh, you wanna run cut uh, regression, which is using only the 25 variables, right? 25 variables. And then there you have to specify the data set over here, cut far. Uh, but this one is going to be your mystery or you are going to be your homework. So that you, be, you are supposed to get those regression results of full model and cut model based on this training set, okay, regression results. And then you will get the estimate of betas here and there, are full and are cut. And then get predictions, right? Um, predict full, are full, based on this are full, okay, are full, that comes from here, right? Um, you run a regression, okay, okay get predictions uh, from type, uh, get a predicted value, get a predicted value based on those betas that you got in your folded training set, okay, training set, get the beta estimate, and then go to the, uh, the test set, the smaller one over here, and then apply those beta hat, and then predict the failure, okay? Our response, okay, will be there. Um, yeah, so you do it with the full model and cut model, and then for full model versus cut model, which, right, which uh, will be better in predicting out of sample failure is the question, 
okay, out of sample prediction for the failure. Uh, calculate and then the log r squared will be produced with this uh, code over here. And then, so this is the, uh, the code that you have to work on, but your homework okay, is to take care of this cut far and then see uh, whether you can uh, compare this uh, in sample versus out of sample, okay? The cut model versus um, full model predictability, okay? So that's something you could try, all right? Uh, in your homework, okay? That's that. Now, uh, if we get back to our, um, yeah, slide, it will look like this, right? Look like this. You remember we had 10 folds, right? 10 folds. And 10 times we run a regression for both full model and cut model. So that you're going to have R squared, okay? R squared, 10 of them. Uh, full model and then 10 of the R squared in the cut model. And we can think about the distribution of this R squared, okay? And the thing is, R squared over here in the full model is widespread, whereas the cut model is very, very small small, tiny, um, cut model has mean uh, out of squared, uh, out of sample R squared of 0 0.09, about half in, in sample R squared, okay? Uh, in sample R squared used to be like 18%, right? You see that? But it's 9% out of sample in cut model. How about the full model? It's terrible. It's overfit and worse than Y bar, okay? Negative I R squared. Okay, are more common than you might expect. Um, negative R squared means like completely wasting it, right? Nothing explains it. So if you think about the definition of R squared, right? R squared um, being negative R squared means like what? Over here, okay, one minus this ugly thing, okay? Well, whole thing is negative means that this guy is bigger than one, and that means the deviance based on your model is bigger than the deviance of your null model, beta zero, which is your variance of the dependent variable. So why did you ever produce the, 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 uh, the deviance with your uh, full model in the first place will become become the question, right? Um, so that's what I'm talking about over here, right? Yes. So uh, R squared, right? Being negative. Whew. That's terrible. You want it to be positive. At least cut model is giving you some positive uh, R squared. So your model is, is valid over there, even though R squared is, is 9%, okay? It's okay. Um, yeah, all that matters is out of sample R squared. We don't care about in sample R squared in machine learning. Using R, uh, out of sample experiments to choose the best model is called cross-validation. It will be big part of, a big part of our big data lives. Selection of the best model is at the core of all big data. Okay, uh, but before getting to selection, we first need strategies to build good sets of candidate models to choose amongst. Okay, um, and then FDR as a selection tool is there for you. Um, it's a heretical way to think about Q, the, you remember 0 0.1 threshold or something, a tuning parameter, um, which Q should be choose is up to you. Still, those subjectivity is there. Nothing is completely devoid of those subjectivity. Uh, maybe we grab models for Q 0 0.1, 0 0.2, blah, 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 and compare. You can think about that. Problems with testing FDR is that uh, this FDR theory requires independence between tests. Um, so independence between tests means like the 200 variables that you've thrown in to that uh, semiconductor regression, those things are not independent, but we are assuming to be independent, which doesn't make sense. So that is a problem with FDR. 
this almost never holds. In regression, multicollinearity causes problems. Given two highly correlated x's, you are unsure which to use. You then get big p-value and neither variable is significant. Regression p-values are based on the full model. This is um, probably a terrible model. And then p-values only exist for p less than n. Okay. Oh, how would you create, right, your prediction model using your data, okay? One approach would be like this. Well, there is a predictor like bankruptcy or silico uh, silicon uh, failure, right, semiconductor failure, and then a whole bunch of potential predictors, those variables, 200 of them, you saw that, right? Uh, bankruptcy is like too many variables are there, right? Um, so what would you do? The first approach is like what? Uh, bring one variable at one time to do that regression and then see the R squared. Okay? 200 times you will do that in 200 different R squared variables you will see it. Okay? Um, which has the best predictive power? Keep that one. And then, next round, you run a regression with the remaining part. Now you have one variable as your right-hand side variable, and then throw in one by one variable, okay, the second round, okay? Um, uh, for bankruptcy, uh, for example, leverage may be over there, right? The best predictor may be, okay? We don't know, but you're going to see it. And then, leverage, and then... Next round, you throw in one by one, again, one by one, each variable to see which variables paired with this leverage variable best predict bankruptcy. So afterwards, you will find the best predictor, okay, uh, which increases your R squared, okay? And then, you, now you have the two variables sitting there in your logic regression of bankruptcy. Maybe that's stock return. Now you have leverage ratio and stock return variable to predict bankruptcy. Third round is stick in those variables one by one again. Okay, starting from CEO, age, tenure, all these kind of things. And then uh, see which one maximizes those R squared together with this already set two variables. One by one by one by one, you can increase the explanatory variables like that. That's forward stepwise regression, okay? So forward stepwise procedure, start from a simple null model and incrementally update fit to allow slightly more complexity and better than backward method. Backward method is what? Where you start with 200 variables in semiconductor regression and then drop one okay one by one 199 and then which one works best right by throwing out um you can become clueless by doing that you it'll, it'll be much more screwy the full model okay uh can be expensive or tough to fit while the uh while the null model is usually available in closed form Closed form means like mathematically, formula-wise, tractable, mathematically expressible, okay? Um, what do you mean tractable or closed form? For non-mathematicians, don't worry about it. Whether it is, whether it, is it expressible with mathematical formula versus not, okay, is the difference. Huh? Isn't all the number expressible with mathematical formula? The answer is no. The answer is no. Only a small part of those numbers are expressible with mathematical formula. The others are not really, okay? That's the difference. Jitter the data and the full model can change dramatically because it's overfit. The norm are uh, always the same. Um, stepwise approaches are greedy. They find the best solution at each step without so, uh, thought to, uh, without thought to global path properties. So that's the thing. Um, yeah. 
naive forward stepwise regression, the step parentheses in R execute, executes a common routine. It fall, uh, fit all univariate models, choose that with the highest R squared in sample, by the way, and put that variable, say, x1 in your model, okay? And then fit all bivariate models, including x1 and xj, and add xj from 1 with the highest R squared to your model. Repeat that procedure, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? Um, until you exhaustively run, run all those variables. You stop when the model selection rule AIC is lowest for the current model than for any of the models that add one variable. So you hit the AIC minimum and then the next one, sorry, AIC pops up, then you stop. Okay, that's optimal solution, right? Um, and then forward stepwise regression is in R. Easiest way to step parenthesis is run null and full regressions, right? Null and full like this. And then forward will be like step null scope equals formula full. And then dir equals forward. Direction is forward, okay? Not backward. Okay, scope is the biggest possible model. Uh, and then... Iterate for iterations, interactions, yeah, forward two, step wide forward two, and then stay like this. But this is out of scope, though you don't need to worry about it. Da. Example, semiconductor. So let me get back to this slide. Uh, not the slide, by the way. The code, yes. Yes. Um, all right, GLM, da, 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 what are the averages of ours? Forward stepwise, okay, regression, procedure, right? Null, you run a regression, and then forward stepwise, like, wait a minute, okay, like this. And you will see over here, you carefully look at it, step right and fail dependent variable and you see more and more variables coming in the explanatory variable as in your right hand side each time it is running like what i described before until it reaches the minimum point of aic and that's it okay um so it takes about you know, it takes a long time by the way 90 seconds plus they say but it's going to be more in my computer, 100 and plus seconds over here to identify those guys with the best predictability. Now, if we, yeah, you see this increasing, right? Like that. Um, right. Yeah, the problem with this, right, stepwise forward regression, is that it is very slow. And uh, this is true in general with subset selections and then enumerate candidate models by applying maximum likelihood estimation for subsets of coefficients with the rest set to zero. <coughs> subset selection is slow because adding one variable to a regression can change fit dramatically. Each model must be fit from scratch. Uh, a, related sub, uh, 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 a related subtle issue is stability, but massively important. Um, MLE, right? Stability, right? Certain variables prediction, like the predictability or this coefficient. How stable is it? Okay, is an issue. Now, before I catch the phone, I should show you this result still going on. And so now um, the forward stepwise regression about semiconductor failure is done. Um, 136.6 seconds and uh, you see all these 
variables are selected to be meaningful, right, in this framework. Okay. Um, anyway, so it has a problem as I mentioned before, right? Then, what else? Here you go, right? Um, yeah, MLEs have high sampling variability. They change a lot from one data set to another. So which MLE model is best changes a lot. Um, prediction based on the best model will have high variance uh, and the big variance leads to big expected errors. So there is a problem. Um, there comes uh, regularization in that sense in the picture of big picture of model selection, which is called the 정규화 or 제약을 줬다 in Korean terminology. All right. Um, what do you mean? Well, the key to contemporary statistics is regularization. We are departing from optimality to stabilize a system. What do you mean departing from optimality? The least squared estimate by Gauss, right? was to find out the linear um, model that optimizes in that, well, the least square distance is achieved, okay? From the predicted ones to the actual observations, the least square distance, the optimality was achieved. And then unbiased, right? Um, those things were achieved, but we have to sacrifice one for the other. Okay, the variability is an issue. This, uh, well, we're going to get there. The minimized deviance, okay, is the thing. Okay, uh, here I we have the formula in the likelihood function uh, format. Okay, LHD stands for likelihood, likelihood, right? Uh, and then beta. And then for this regularization explanation for Korean students, I mean, you can Google search this, right? There are tons of great lectures about regularization, Korean language over here, perhaps the best one. Um, so you can benefit out of it. But let me try with English version myself. Okay. It's very challenging, by the way. Uh, anyway, um, motivation of regularization, the way I understand it is this way. It's all about out of sample forecasting, okay? How good is your statistical model, okay? Y equals function of X or a linear function of X, which is X beta like this, okay? And let's say you want to make a bankruptcy prediction model. So uh, you estimated uh, Y equals F hat of X or Y equals X beta hat with the data over the period of this period, 1992 to 2018, right? Y is a dummy variable that is one if bankrupt in the next year, T plus one, and zero otherwise. So T, for this year, 2018, you have X, Y should go into 2019, right? Now, bring those F hat or beta hat and input X data of 2019, one year forward, and then try to predict the bankruptcy in 2020, okay? Remember that beta, okay, is estimated in the previous years, not this year, right? In 2019, and you want to predict the bankruptcy of 2020, okay? Still, you're, you, you, we are living in 2020, so it, it will be benefit, uh, beneficial for us if the model works nicely so that we can predict which company, oh, you will go bankrupt and you will survive. We'll have some good idea out of it, okay? Um, how good would your model be is a question. Now, it's going to be like a shooting, pew, like pew, archeries or pew, 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 gun, right? Uh, gun shooting in a target, okay? Like a shooting for forecasting, bankrupt, 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 or not, blah, 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 like that, okay? Some archers or gun shooters, well, ideally, you want to forecast very accurately, okay? Um, but only in your wildest dreams, right? Actually, it does not work that way, okay? You want your forecasting to be unbiased and then 
have low variance, very accurate in both ways, right? But in reality, it's not. Either you have high variance, you're shooting randomly bah, 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 here and there, but sometimes you hit it too, right? Or high bias over there. You are 0.5 조정. If you are, if you worked in a, a, a military service, you will be uh, familiar with this 0.5 조정, right? It's like uh, initially see where you your bias is, so that oh, you have a tendency to shoot upwards, right? relative to the correct target. So biased upwards. So you have some bias would be there. So either you have high variance or high bias or both. If you have both, you're in serious trouble. Nothing gets in there. Ha! So this one you take out. That one is ideal, but reality is somewhere over here, right? Somewhere is over there, right? Don't ask me whether I was a good shooter or not. Ah, terrible PRI, PRI, Pinago, Albegigo, Igaligo, right? Uh, kind of things, right? Um, fine. Uh, all right. So, uh, what is the prediction error? Expected prediction error is the thing that we want to talk about here. EPE of why? Because why is the shooting result, right? The prediction result why? And then F hat is our prediction, okay? And then our prediction and then the prediction result. Um, the square term of this distance or difference is what we want to understand, want to analyze. And this is, right, EPE of predicting Y using F hat of X given X is small x. Our data is given, okay? And then the future forecasting is there. And then based on this hat, based on previous data, okay, out of sample forecasting, in sample estimation, the difference will be there. Okay, how do we analyze this one? Well, if we take this, right, it becomes like this, okay? Um, we call it reducible error and an irreducible error like this two part. Uh, irreducible part is about innate variability within that Y. No matter what we do, okay, in prediction, given the data, the Y will be varying in itself. Irreducible part is there. But there are some parts that we can reduce. Um, that comes from the model, okay, model, ideal model versus the estimated model, parameter model versus estimated model, okay. Um, this reducible error is either creating this high variance or high bias. Okay, we're going to analyze that part mathematically. Okay, irreducible part, that's something, um, leave it there. Reducible error, mean squared error, MSE of estimating f of x using f hat at a fixed point x. That's this guy. Irreducible error is simply the variance of y given x. Essentially noise that do not... We want to uh, learn. It's a white noise, okay, kind of things. Now, um, ir uh, the reducible error of uh, variance decomposition, uh, variance bias, bias variance decomposition should we should do, okay, decomposing into two parts. The reducible error, two parts, bias versus variance in the the shooting target picture. You can th think about it that way. MSE. If you do the math and arithmetic, it looks like this. It works like this, okay? Bias of an estimator should be defined like this. Expectation of your beta estimate minus the true beta. True beta is a parameter that you cannot observe. I told you in my finance class, the true value of your company is not observable. The price is observable, right? So you can think of it an equivalent way, maybe, a little bit. In that sense, the uh, true value, true beta, true whatever is not observable, is not there, it's what we call parameter. If it is, your estimation is unbiased, like Gauss-Markov theorem, right? If that happens, then your beta hat, on average, the beta hat will be your true beta. That's unbiased situation. A variance of an estimator beta hat, we are talking about the variance of beta hat. Not the x, the 
the data matrix that we are talking about. We are talking about the variance of this beta hat. That should be defined like this. Uh, expected value of beta hat minus expected value of beta hat squared. Okay. Um, did I e that pi gamma or something? Anyway, um, funny. Um, yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, MSE of f f x and then f hat of x should be like this. And then if you do the math, 완전 제곱식 or the uh, squared. Okay. Uh, if you do the square, it will look like this. And then it will decompose into if you follow this one into this nice format like this one trick that i do over here is i add and subtract with the same number same thing okay mathematician's favorite technique add and subtract with the same number same item so that this guy becomes that and that guy becomes this make sense and then the first item turns out to be bias squared because we defined this guy as bias over here is that right yes uh yes instead of beta hat and beta we have f and f hat okay um this is beta hat let's see and this is beta true okay true function true beta true whatever and then estimate it right and that is bias okay and then square it that's bias squared and then over here is a variance of f hat which is equivalent to beta hat over here that's this guy right so we have uh, decomposition of mean squared error into bias squared and variance like this so um, what so what well in the next slide let's go EPE right which is um, wait yeah uh, EPE expected prediction error expected prediction error yes turns out to be reducible error plus irreducible error and then it decomposes into further into bias squared plus variance plus irreducible error okay remember gauss markov theorem blue meaning best minimum variance which is this guy is minimized already and unbiased this guy is zero gauss markov that's why it is so sexy right all you have is irreducible error and then this is minimum that's why it was beautiful but machine learning we say let's get realistic here okay you cannot achieve both unbiasedness and minimum variance okay so maybe we could just let the bias go on and then variance we can reduce it somehow Okay, that's one approach we're going to do over here. Um, yeah. Uh, and then uh, as long as you know the direction of the bias, right? Bias upwards. You can uh, uh, manually lower down later on. Okay. Uh, with that understanding of bias. But the variance part, let's reduce it. Okay. Um, you can, uh, yeah. So that's the way I understand it over here um overfitting and underfitting we have to discuss over here okay before we move on further um here the the here is an explanatory variable hap that happened to be time over here time okay time explanatory variable x um and then y variable is over there we have three different scen scenarios over here one is you have very simple model um, that may be even underfitting in explaining and forecasting the realization of the dependent variable over here. Uh, on the other hand, on the right hand side, far right hand side, what you see is a potentially overfitted model. Let's say uh, over here is let's say y equals 
ax plus a a plus bx plus uh, ax plus a, a, a plus bx uh it, it's on like a linear relation um over here let's say y you say imposed should be a plus a plus b x plus c x squared plus blah 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 plus n times x to the power of n n 차방정식 crazy up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down um what the hell why did you do that the purpose was to minimize the residual okay minimize the residual least squared distance least squared error in that sense the prediction line your regression line passes through each and every single uh, dot so that your residual will be zero residual squared will be still zero so you are happy you're fitted perfectly we call it overfitting okay what's the problem with this one well in the future or some data comes in okay you estimated this until 2018 but you bring in the data of 2019 there's no guarantee that the uh, the dots will be fitting into this um, polynomial or the complicated your regression model I'm pointing to the dots that was not dotted before because this is going to be a new data it's not gonna be like this but maybe something like this okay and then you will have terrible out of sample prediction okay that's a problem of overfitting okay you overdid the data uh, in that sense right who says that x to the power of n should be an important predictor likewise not just x to the power of n but many different variables in semiconductor regression right instead of being x and x squared and x to the power of n you had 200 different variables right one variable two variables three variables n variables who says that n variables is really needed over there okay you're overfitting it lack of probability uh, the pro forecastability in the future predictability out of sample that's a problem so you don't want to underfit you don't want to overfit you need a goldilocks region of optimality good fit and robust uh like x squared kind of uh, quadratic format over here quadratic function ichahamsu kind of things right so that is over here what you, what you see over here is degree of overfitting on your horizontal axis as you start from underfitting to over go to overfitting what happens in the error is that the errors is you start with big errors extreme underfitting by the way is the case when you your regression is just beta equals zero constant only so that yeah is over here the errors will be huge the variation is to population huge like total sum of squared is this guy right that error is very big high bias is over here and the high variance is over here as well but as you fit the model by throwing in one variable two three four n variables um, you start to fit better and better and better and then after a certain point you will be overfitting like this okay um, interesting thing is the out of sample test data okay the interesting thing is this guy what I showed you with this black line is in sample data okay but out of sample data follows this pattern of red line over here so that when you're overfitting it out of sample uh, performance will be bad the variance will be high over here uh, uh, back to high variance situation um, so that is a problem okay um, yes excuse me machine learning in sample data uh, training set out of sample data uh, test set it's the thing I want to distinguish how do we get from overfitted model to optimally fitted model is a serious question regularization is about giving some constraints to the regression we do constraints um, 
What do you mean constraints? Didn't we have enough of constraints in the first place? No, we were just minimizing the square distance, right? Um, but we are adding one more restrictions. Um, compromising bias, but reducing variance. That is a purpose. Least squares method by Gauss looked like this. If we go back to our linear regression, here we have only two explanatory variables, x1 and x2, right? Now, what? Regularization. For example, ridge regression, which is the starting kind of regularization. We'll go to lasso later on, but ridge regression looks like this. Minimize this guy. Oh, that's the same, but subject to this constraint. Beta 1 squared plus beta 2 squared should be less than or equal to 30. Well, where does that 30 come from? I just... You know, I just threw it in, threw in one random number over there. Okay, positive. By the way, uh, squared plus squared, this looks more like a circle equation. Uh, have you learned about this in your high school? Right? We are going to get to this beta 1, beta 2 idea. Not x, y. You have x and y over here. Why beta? Because we are concerned about estimating beta and we, are, we can understand, interpret this beta as a variable in and of itself. Um, if you draw that in that space of beta 1 and beta 2, this guy will look like a circle and then constrained to be inside the circle. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Uh, we're going to get to this pack picture later on. Um, so which pair of beta is best, right? We have beta 1 and beta 2 pairs that you estimated. Let's say you estimated <coughs> like this, 4, 5, 3, 5, blah, 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 like this, possible betas. And then you can compute with this beta squared summation. That is the second column. And then you also have MSE, mean squared error, for each regression result, right? Mean squared error, 20, to blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, without constraint, which beta is the best? Well, this guy. Why? Because the mean squared error is the minimum, right? Gauss said, what's the minimum, right? Achieving the minimum mean squared error, take that beta as an estimate. Um, but in machine learning with this um, uh, regularization approach with rich regression, they say, Further restriction, uh, one restriction is that the beta squared summation is less than certain point uh, value. Let's say 30 over here. All right. Then by definition, okay, those beta summation being bigger than this guy should be out of the picture. Ding, dan, dan. The remaining part are the candidates, right? Out of it, out of it. We want to go for the minimum mean squared error, which is this guy. So that's why the ridge regression result will be 2, 4 for beta 1 and beta 2, whereas the least squared regression result will be 5, 4, 5. Okay? The, the, the coefficient estimate changes accordingly because of the restraint, the cons uh, constraint. Okay? Um, Yes. All right. Rich regression looks like this, minimizing mean squared error with a constraint about beta squared. Okay. Rich regression is about the beta squared. Why squared? Well, because it's a measure, way of measuring the distance between two points. Okay. Um, Pythagorean distance kind of things. So, no, no, no. It's uh, squared, right? Something squared is always positive. So can you can uh, never negative, right? so that you can measure the distance well, okay? I think mathematicians call it L2 space, but you don't have to memorize this one. Anyway, uh, beta hat to ridge regression looks like this. That says argmin of uh, beta, which uh, the argmin means, means what? Um, it should be the argument that minimizes the following formula, okay? The argument should be beta. The argument beta. What is the beta? Okay, what is the beta that minimizes the following? Okay, subject to this condition. 
that's ridge regression. Then specifying the cons constraint like this is equivalent to beta hat plus beta uh, squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, that, this is just the summation in two dimension setting. Beta hat one squared, beta two squared like this. Um, this is equivalent to writing like this. Argmin of beta that minimizing the following, the least squares part, yeah, the same thing, and gamma times the summation of beta j squared. And j starts from 1 to p, the number of parameters that you throw in, the variables that you throw in into that regression. Okay, whatever variable that you throw in, once you estimate the beta, square it and sum it up. Oh, yeah, square it and then sum it up and multiply it by a certain fixed number, a certain number, positive number, lambda. Okay, beta squared summation and then multiply lambda to this ugly term. Okay, um, we want to minimize the, the whole total of this guy instead of minimizing this guy. Okay, so you have a more burden right now. Um, okay, why not t but lambda? But just that that's a con uh, convention over here in machine learning guys. Uh, while t is inversely related to lambda, okay? Mathematically, it should happen that way. You will see later. Anyway, um, if you go down the contour, chachi, right? How does the uh, mean squared error kind of things, chachi, right? Trace kind of things, contour, 등고선 kind of things, look like MSE, right? Mean squared error um, is, looks like this, right, in OLS. And then what? Well, you decompose this guy, and then you will realize that you can uh, summarize this into an equation that uh, with respect to beta 1 and beta 2, okay? And it turns out, Beta 1 and beta 2 quadratic function pops up, okay, if you follow the math, right? Um, as it turns out, if you have beta 1 squared and beta 2 squared and in multiplication of it, and that is something called Koning equation. Koning equation, what do you mean? Why didn't I learn equasuhan? You will regret. You should, okay? We all should regret. <laughs> Your 외국어 고등학교, that was suck, right? That sucked. Um, like foreign language school is important, but forgetting about math was terrible mistake. So I bring that back. Okay, conic equation is like this one. Uh, as it turns out, if you, you know, form a cones, right? Kaltegi, um, with some toaji kind of things like this, then you can cut it in various ways and then you can represent this kind of tanmyeon um, or says cut cut areas, right, in this kind of quadratic form, okay, uh, involving those square terms of x and y variable, or beta 1 and beta 2, okay. Uh, circle, ellipse, or parabola and hyperbola can be forming, okay. And why are we bothering it? By de but because depending on the forms of this, we can, tra we can see the trace or contour of the MSE, okay, MSE area, okay, how does it look like? In the end, it will look like ellipse, right, over here. And that matters a lot, that matters a lot. Um, discriminant for Koenig equation, I'm not going to test this on your exam, but just watch it. Um, don't, just to be avoiding the situation, you're going to be discouraged too much by the engineer guys, right? Uh, elliptic equation, right? Uh, 판별식, b 제곱 minus i c. Yeah, you remember that part. That's it. If it is minus over here, then it is elliptic form. That's one thing. Don't ask me why. Google search it, right? As it turns out, this is conic uh, and then elliptic equation. And so contour of MSC will be at uh, elliptic form. 타원형, right? Like, uh, so what does that imply to us? 
So beta 1 and beta 2 space, we can think about it, okay? Beta 1 and beta 2. Remember, this is not about x1 and x and y, but about the beta coefficients that we want to estimate, right? And then those beta 1 and beta 2 space in a plane like this, the rigid regression is like this on the uh, right-hand side, okay? So initially, you start with um, OLS regression, least squares coefficient, okay? Least squares coefficient, that's beta hat, which is beta A. Let me, um, shall I use this one? Yeah, beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat, like that, right? And then, and then you must have some contours of um, RSS. The, what is that? The mean squared error. Mean squared error? Why? How do you know? Because that's exactly what we were doing in the previous slide over here. The mean squared error, okay? Remember this was about square the sum of your residuals, right? And that we are interpreting this mean squared errors from the perspective of beta 1 and beta 2 over here, in the final uh, equation over here, okay? And then, so uh, mean squared error turns out to be elliptic form of beta 1 and beta 2. Holy cow! So let's say you start it over here, in the initial ellipse, and then what do you do? Oh, it does not satisfy. This one, by the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you start with a point over here. Okay, you start with a point over here, and you realize that, oh, this mean squared error satisfying beta 1 and beta 2 does not satisfy the constraint. Okay, you start from a dot, but realize that it does not satisfy the constraint that you have to be within this circle. So what do you do? Expand your ellipse one by one like this. Okay? Until when? Until it touches upon this circle. Ah, tangent point. Yes, that is basically it. The ridge regression coefficient of beta one and beta two will be this guy, beta one hat rich and then beta 2 hat rich and compare the original OLS beta 1 and beta 2 hat okay beta 2 hat what do you see well the magnitude shrank down shrinks down right so it's a shrinkage approach okay um, shrinkage of beta uh, the uh, the so so the shrinkage is the approach that we are taking in this regularization process. What do you mean a shrinkage? Remember, we get to that uh, testing of beta was about whether this beta is equal to what, zero or not. Our null hypothesis beta was beta equals zero, which is this guy. Okay, beta. Being zero means like this variable does not have any explanatory power. Garbage pew, throughout, right? And the shrinkage approach means what? Oh, this beta, it's just rather than saying anything else, just throw it out. Let's just push it to the, right? Tone it down to zero. Shrink it down to zero. That's our approach, okay? Because... There are too many, you know, uh, variables available out there, but uh, which is, you know, we know they're going to be garbage uh, most of the time. So let's just push it, right, to zero. That's the approach we are doing it with elliptic tangent point approach. Okay? Now, that's ridge regression. And then you may question, what the heck do you show me over here? On, your, on our left-hand side, this is the lasso regression, the lasso regression. Um, there, okay, you see the contrast immediately. What? The only contrast that you can make is this constraint space. Constraint is not circle, but this diamond. Diamond, yes. 
um, absolute value wise okay this is absolute value wise distance you want to you know have some constraint okay uh, what's the benefit of it well it quickly converges to beta uh, being zero okay over here beta one was started from here but we shrank down but until to this part it's still not zero weekly zero right but over here um by definition this absolute value function is not um, differentiable 미분 가능하지가 않아요 at this end point it is just a straight line so that if you expand this ellipse then you are more likely to reach this end point pointed this part very quickly which means at this point where does this beta hat beta one hat shrink to shrink down to zero immediately beta two hat Beta 2 hat, let's say, right? It shrinks down, but not to zero. Hmm, interesting. So um, that's one benefit of lasso. Let's go through one by one about this argument. Um, the next slide. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The minim minimize the, the pen penalize the deviance, deviance plus a cost on the size of coefficients, right? Remember, lambda is multiplied to the whole ugly term of cost function of beta summation and multiply lambda over there. So we can think about the lambda being applied to a whole bunch of betas at the same time. Okay, um, Minimizing this one, instead of uh, OLS regression, let's go to this um, likelihood um, estimation maximum likelihood estimation okay like this like logic regression logistic regression c of beta k is cost function of beta um used to be beta squared for ridge and it's going to be absolute value for uh, the lasso and then depending on the form of cost of beta we have ridge regression lasso regression etc etc okay fine then what? Um, lasso, yes, absolute value. That's why we have A over here, least absolute shrinkage and the selection operator. The acronym is lasso, okay? Um, this guy, absolute value, you see it, okay, of beta is the one. The cost function is absolute value function. And then here, instead of... Uh, uh, MSC of OLS, I just throw in the likelihood function that we want to maximize. Um, okay, um, the thing is, here, all right, um, the next slide, yes. Yeah, decision theory is based uh, on the idea uh, that choices have cost, estimation, and hypothesis testing. What are those costs, right? It's about estimation and then testing. Estimation uh, cost is about deviance is the cost of uh, distance between the data and the model. The deviance itself is costly. And recall this residual squared and summation of it, or um, that was about OLS, right? And the other is about the probability model, right? Of uh, uh, logistic regression kind of things. Um, log of probability and uh, times y of occurrence one or zero dummy variable and then one minus y would be the opposite of this dummy variable times log of one minus probability okay um so this one and testing is costly costly since beta hat being zero is safe right or no uh, it should cost us to decide otherwise um, the cost of beta hat is deviance plus a penalty away from zero, right? Um, yeah. Um, then the regularization regression, the uh, cost function, right? Looks like this um, cost function graph. Well, you see this formula over here again. Lambda should be positive, by the way. 
uh, is a penalty weight and C is a cost function. C is a cost function. Um, and then the C should be designed in such a way that it should be minimum when beta is zero. Now, when man, I mean, it's like a, it's, it, unless uh, otherwise, you know, it's very extreme cases or a very, very important one, just, you know, you know, uh, you know keep beta as zero. You shut up, right? It, this is the kind of the approach, right? So that the cost will be zero when beta is zero. And when man, I mean, beta is zero, like, that's, I don't know how to translate in English. When man, I mean, it's like a kind of, um, yeah. So beta value on your horizontal axis, when it is zero, uh, rich regression, the cost function is squared, quadratic. So it's minimum over here and then square term. You see the scale go up, going up until 400 over here. Lasso is about absolute value, right? Zero, minimum. But it increases in a linear fashion in both ways. And then the scale is different compared to this, right? A lot slower. And then you have elastic net, which is a combination of these two guys, right? Combination of these two guys in that over here, beta squared uh, plus the plus absolute value of beta. So it's a combination of these two. So it should be shaped like a bit pointed parabola, pointed parabola, right? Uh, log uh, uh, cost function is also there. It's more concave over here, okay? Concave. Um, the data science guys have whole lot of stories to tell about what these different cost functions are intended for, but I'm not going to test you on that. So this is more applied to finance, okay? Um, yeah, this one is inducing you to be converging faster, right, to the zero and then whereas this guy leaves room for the beta to be over here or there that's the difference that i understand anyway um that's that and then penalization can yield automatic variable selection so when man is it's like a, a please just make it zero a if you unless you really really need it so that's the approach so that you naturally select with this lasso and rich regression okay so uh, that's the idea Okay, um, the minimum of a smooth and pointy function can be at the, po uh, at the point, but it's not the scope of our class too much. Anything with an absolute value will do this, and there are many penalty options and far too much theory. Think of lasso as a baseline and others as uh, variations on it. Okay, rich and lasso. Okay, lasso reg regularization path, right? Um, regularization path, what do you mean? Well, we're going to build some kind of path about betas, changing beta value as you increase lambda or decrease lambda, shall I say? You start with biggest lambda, pos positive number of lambda, and then biggest penalty. So much so scared that all the beta should be zero. Okay. You, all the beta should be zero when the lambda is very big, but as you shrink or, or as you reduce the lambda, okay, smoothly reduce lambda, you will start to have some betas popping up, okay, popping up so that it can go either positive ways or negative direction, right? And then uh, each and every lambda, right, you can plot some beta traces, okay? Um, not just one beta, but 200 different betas or thousands of betas may pop up, okay? It's going to be a beautiful spectrum kind of beta shaping, beta path that you see. The lasso fits beta hat to minimize that guy. We will do this for a sequence of penalties, lambda 1, lambda 2, all the way down to lambda t, big T. And lambda start with a big lambda, okay? and then shrink it down. Remember, this is, has to be positive, but you know, there. Then we can apply MADA selection tools to choose best lambda hat. Um, where does that, you know, some criteria uh, satisfies, like AIC minimized kind of things, right? At which lambda point? We're gonna cut there, and then whatever beta that is non-zero, we're gonna take it. And that's gonna be our explanatory variables, 
and the other variables that remain to be zero should be garbage. Turned out, yeah. Yeah, that's our approach. Path estimation. Start with big lambda hat uh, one, so big that beta hat will be zero. Um, t equals two to the big T, right? And then update beta hat to be optimal under lambda t should be smaller than um, lambda t minus one. So starting from the right hand side of your horizontal axis of lambda, move to um, uh, left hand side. In your mirror image, should I say, should have I said this one? And then like this, okay? Um, anyway, since the estimated beta hat changes smoothly along this path, it's fast, each update is easy, okay? And then it's stable, optimal lambda t may change a bit from sample to sample, but that won't affect the model much. It's a better version of forward stepwise selection. All right, so wow, path plots look like this. What you see, right? The whole enterprise, uh, enterprise is easiest to understand visually. Holy cow, what the heck are you showing me, Andy? All right, here, what you see on the uh, horizontal axis is lambda. Oh, not just lambda, but log of lambda. Sorry about that, log of lambda. Ah, log of lambda. Didn't you say lambda is positive? And why do you see minus thing? Because, because once you take, it gets back to this log function over here. Okay. Let's say lambda, lambda is on this right hand, uh, the horizontal axis. This is log of lambda. Okay. And then log function looks like this, right? And then this is one and that is zero. And then log of lambda being minus means like they are over here. Those guys and that guys. That means lambda is somewhere in the one and zero. Okay, slightly positive number. Slightly, slightly, slightly positive number down there. Okay. So that's what's going on over here. Lambda is still positive, very small number, small tiny number. We just reduce it, okay? Uh, starting from big number, and then there is, if lambda is big, then all beta should be zero over here. That's this beta. What you see on your vertical axis is beta hat estimate, okay, coefficients. And then as you, lambda decreases some beta starts to pop up or pop down okay one variable start to be you know sticking up their head i am significant predictor yeah that's this guy all right and i don't know what variable that is but at least we know one variable is important right and as we shrink down lambda further, another variable pops up and stick their head up. Now I am important. Yes, good. We choose one more variable over there as our explanatory variable in the regression. And then a couple of more, a handful of more pops up, keeps on popping up and keeps on being important, right? And then at some point, one guy start to pop down. I am important in negative direction in predicting bankruptcy or pre predicting fa semiconductor failure. That's what's happening. Uh, one more, two more variables pop up da, 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 like this. As you shrink down the la log of lambda or log of lambda or lambda this is the same way, but we are showing it in more uh, dramatic, uh, more visual ways, right? Um, as you shrink down the lambda to the minimum, right? What should be the minimum? I don't know. It's zero, slightly positive number. Every beta pops up <laughs> over there, right? Um, garbages, right? So many garbages around here. But after cer at certain point, you have to cut it. That will be a question, okay? That will be a question. Um, so that's... Um, um, regularization path, path plots, right? 
the algorithm moves right to left over here like this. I showed you, right? The y-axis is beta hat, each line a different beta hat, beta j hat, right? As a function of lambda t, right? I told you before, lambda is multiplied to all betas, right? Summation of all beta squared or summation of all absolute values of betas. Uh, one beta or uh, one lambda going into all different betas. That's the picture. I had a hard time understanding this picture in the first place. Um, if, so if you feel that, what the heck is going on? You're not alone, don't worry. Okay, watch this video time and again. Um, over here, okay, those are the number of variables that is non-zero, explanatory variables. Here it's like 40, here it's like one variable stick up their head, right? And there it's like a 40 variables uh, stick up or down and then showing up because I am important, right? Like that. Okay, so that's that. Um, example, Comscore web browser data is there for you. The uh, online spending data is there uh, by the textbook author. The previous plot is household log online spending regressed on two percentage of time spent on um, various websites. Each beta J is a different site and each different site, hundreds of different site website is over there. Right? That's why we had a lot of garbages like blah, 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 popping up in the lambda being very minimal lambda. Comscore um, records uh, information on uh, browsing and the purchasing behavior of annual panels of household. Browsing history. Does that scare you or so somebody? All right. Um, the author uh, extracted um, 2006 data for 1,000 most heavily trafficked websites and for 10,000 households that spent at least at uh, $1. Why do we care? Predict consumption from browser history. Okay? Browser history. Yeah, yeah. For example, to control for base level spending, say in estimating ad, uh, advertising eff effectiveness, you will see browser history of users when they land, but likely not what they have bought and things like that. Okay? Um, yeah. And an add-on package for Alf, uh, R. Much of R's capability come from its packages. Yeah. So go ahead and read it off. Um, yeah. And then... Um, next page, Lasso Software, the textbook author, right? Matt Taddy uh, developed his own code and uh, you can use that, right? And there are many packages fitting Lasso regressions in R. GLMNet is most common. GAMLR is the author's contribution. These two are very similar and they are very, uh, they share syntax, but difference is what they do beyond the simple lasso. Uh, GLM net does an elastic net and JMLR does gamma lasso like that. Um, and since we stick mostly to lasso, uh, they are nearly equivalent for us. And then this makes, uh, just makes it easier to apply some model selection rules and then um, both use matrix library uh, representation for sparse matrices. And then sparse matrices, just, uh, you know, it's not going to be uh, tested in our exam. Don't worry about it. Uh, out of scope, but you can read it in your textbook. And then the following three slides are out of scope. Um, yeah, the sparse matrix kind of discussions, right? Um, you can enjoy it in your free time. Yeah. Running a lasso, yes, once you have your X and Y, running a lasso is easy. So the code looks like this, and you can do logistic lasso regression too, using this, and family binomial, yes, don't forget. And then this has to be your dependent variable, and you should make sure that Y is numeric, um, 0, 1, dummy variable, uh, here, not a factor, okay? Some common argument is that verb true to get progress printout, and then uh, this guy t, the length of your lambda grid and lambda mean ratio, uh, how close to MLE you get, okay? 
um, so help function is there for you as well so enjoy that part size matters let's say right penalization means that scale of x variable matters uh, example uh, x beta has the same effect as two times beta divided by two but absolute value of beta is twice as much a penalty as um, beta over two absolute value uh, for example, the distance between kilometers versus meters, the unit is different so that your beta magnitude may be different, right? As you switch from kilometer unit of x variable to meter unit variable, the beta, right, will what? Um, expand, expand, right? Um, but you don't mean to get penalized simply by changing the units. So is there any way we can neutralize this thing? You can multiply beta j by standard deviation of the explanatory variable xj, the cost function to standardize. Um, that is, minimize this guy. The cost function now look a little bit different. Less so, but multiplied by the standard deviation of your explanatory variable. Right? Um, it's standardized regression setting okay uh, beta j is penalty is calculated per effect of one standard deviation change in xj okay uh, jm lr and uh, this net uh, both have standardized true by default you only use standardized false if you have good reason okay so make it your habit to use this one that's a uh, issue over here and then regularization and the uh, selection. The lasso minimizes this guy and this sparse regularization auto selects the variables. Sound too good to be true? You need to choose lambda. Think of lambda positive as a, sing a signal to noise filter. It's like a squelch on a radio, like a uh, shutting down the noise, right? Um, we will use cross-validation or information criteria to choose, right? For this part of where should we stop for lambda, okay? That you saw on that path, right? AIC, C kind of things will be there for you. Um, yeah, we will use cross-validation or information criteria to choose and path algorithms are likely to are likely to the whole are, like, uh, are the key to what am I talking about? Yeah, algorithms are key to the whole framework. Yeah, they let us quickly enumerate a set of candidate models. This set is stable, so selected best is probably pretty good. Okay, um, all right, and then prediction versus evidence. Okay, uh, testing is all, all about. Okay. Uh, is this model true or not? We want to know what is my best guess and then the no uh, none of your model will be true for complicated systems um, Instead just try to get as close to the truth as possible and ask which model does best in predicting unseen data Okay, overly simple model will underfit you saw that before uh, available patterns the complicated model overfits and make noisy predictions, right? The goal is to find the sweeps, uh, sweet spot or Goldilocks region in the middle. Uh, even in ca uh, causal inference, we will combine best predicting model to um, obtain structural interpretation for a few chosen variables. So, um, right. Um, Model selection, it's all about prediction. A recipe for model selection is one, find a manageable set of candidate models. Candidate models means like the explanatory variable sets, right? Uh, such that fitting all model is fast. And then number two, choose amongst the, uh, these candidates, the one with best predictive performance in unseen data or out of sample testing, right? One is what the lasso path provides, Two seems impossible, but wait. First, define predictive performance via deviance. And then, uh, then we need to estimate the deviance for a fitted model applied to new independent observations from 
the true data distribution, right? Um, and then, out of sample prediction experiments, looks like this, right? We already saw an out of sample experiment with the semiconductor, right? Se uh, implicitly, we were estimating predictive deviance via R squared. And then the procedure of, of using such experiments to do model selection is called cross validation, right? CV, cross validation. It follows a basic algorithm. Uh, for k, small k being equal to 1 all the way up to big K, right? Um, use a subset of n sub k that is smaller than the number of observations, right? So this is like a folded trading set that I showed you before like this one, right? Um, folded n sub k will be like this, right? subset, all right? Um, <clears throat> Record the error rate for predictions from this fitted model on the left out of left out observations. We will usually measure error rate as deviance, but alternatives include MSE, misclass rate, integrated ROC, or error quantiles and things like that. Uh, for ROC, wait for a wait uh, a bit, right? Uh, you, you can see it in the next slide or something. But we're going to formally work on that later. And then you care about both average and spread of out of sample error. Now, ROC, this is not return on capital. Uh, sorry for you guys, uh, finance guys, right? Um, this is receiver operating characteristic curve or ROC curve. Um, this is a graphical plot that illustrates the di diagnostic ability of a binary uh, classifier system. Binary, yes or no. Bankrupt or healthy. COVID-19 versus healthy. And as its discrimination threshold is varied. The method was developed for operators of military radar receivers, which is why it is so named. Okay, So what you see on your um, horizontal axis is false positive rate, okay, false positive rate, false discovery rate kind of things. True positive rate is on your vertical axis, okay, true positive, false positive, okay, and then 45 degrees line is like, a, you know, worthless prediction model. You get flipping a coin randomly and a half and half chance, you can predict it that way. That's 45 degrees line, okay, no model needed. But as the model has more predictive power, this curve will become more concave and more concave so that you can discriminate with this uh, false positive uh, with true positive rate. True positive rate increasing faster while positive, uh, false positive rate is kept minimal. Okay? That's what uh, this ROC curve is showing. Okay? You want this, the model to be like this green line or even better. Anyway, so that's ROC. K-fold cross-validation looks like this. Yeah, the picture over there. Fold the paper or the, sh the sample like that. And one option is to just take repeated random samples. It's better to fold your data and sample a random ordering of the data. Important to avoid order dependence. Split the data into K-folds. Um, first, second, and etc., etc. K folds, so 100 divided by K. Uh, K is 10, then 10% 10 will be chosen. Uh, K is 20, then 5% will be chosen, right? First 5%, second 5%, etc. You fold the data and cycle through K uh, cross validation iterations with a single fold left out. Okay? Single fold left out. This guarantees each observation is left out of, for validation and lower, uh, lowers the sampling variance of cross-validation model selection, leave one cut CV with big K equals N uh, is nice, but um, but takes a long time. Um, K5 or 10 is just fine in most applications. So don't get too much complicated, right? Um, just 5 to 10 is just good enough. Now, CV lasso, cross-validation lasso is also there, right? So the lasso pass algorithm minimizes this guy over the sequence of penalty weights like that. 
And this gives us a path of t fitted coefficient vectors like this beta 1 through beta t, big T, hat, each defining deviance for new data like this. Okay? Um, set the sequence of penalties lambda 1 through t, then for each, uh, each of k being 1 through k, big K, folds, right? Fit the path beta 1 through beta big T on all data except fold k, except fold k. Uh, get fitted deviance on a left out data, okay? And then this gives us, uh, yeah, if you see this formula over here, right? Um, probability, it's a logistic regression. And then what's the y given your data x, but beta coefficient being estimated at the training set. Remember, this is test set, but the beta is coming from the training set. That's what this is talking about. Okay, this gives us k draws of out of sample deviance for each lambda t. Finally, use the result to choose the best lambda hat, then refit the model, uh, all of the data by minimizing this guy. Okay. All right, then, then, both GAM LR and then GAL, uh, GLM uh, net have functions to wrap this all up. The syntax is the same, just prefer, uh, preface with CV, cross-validation. CV, spender, uh, we're going to go through this part a little later. And then coefficient um, gives you beta hat at the best lambda t. Okay, select, select minimum uh, gives lambda t with minimum average out of sample deviance, right? Minimum average out of sample deviance is important one. Select LSE defines best as biggest lambda t with average out of sample deviance no more than one standard deviation away from the minimum. This one is more of a conservative approach. So in the first bullet point, there you pick up the lambda that minimizes out of sample uh, deviance, average out of sample deviance, the minimum point. There will be a series of uh, set of beta hats and set of explanatory variables popping up. I'm important, but to be more conservative, you have to throw out some of them, okay? Those supposedly important variables throw out as garbages, right? To be more conservative. That's the second bullet point. Set the sta uh, one standard error, right? Start with the minimum, okay, point, lambda, and then one standard error back. So uh, you are gonna leave, uh, you're gonna left with, be left with a lot less number of betas, a lot less number of uh, explanatory variables, just to be conservative, not to throw in garbages. Um, defines based as uh, biggest lambda hat with average out of sample deviance, no more than one standard deviation away from the minimum. One standard error is default and balances prediction uh, against the false discovery. Min is purely focused on um, predictive performance. Okay. Um, yeah, CV lasso. Right, log lambda is on your right hand uh, the, the, the horizontal axis. Again, the routine is most easily uh, understood visually. What you see over here, log lambda on your horizontal axis, what you see on your uh, vertical axis is not beta, okay, not beta, but mean squared error, okay, mean squared error. So this is different from that beta path, lasso path, right? Mean squared error, well, as you start with big lambda, the what is it? The mean squared error or deviance must be big. Okay, big deviance, you don't want it. You want to minimize it, minimize it as you increase, uh, as you decrease lambda and try to predict with beta uh, betas, right? And after a after certain point, it start to increase back again, okay? I told you before, overfitting increases the noise, right? When it comes to out of sample testing, the variance increases in your uh, conceptual map, that, uh, conceptual diagram that I showed you before, right? That's precisely this part, 
right? The noisiness increases as you overfit the model. So you don't want to go there. You don't go get back over here. What's the point of minimum MSE? That's this lambda with this da -da 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 line. And then one standard error away from it, okay, should be more conservative choice of it. So that's the optimal point. And not in the minus three, but somewhere over here. All right, so that's the argument over here. Um, yes, and then problems with cross-validation is also there. Nothing is perfect in this world. It is time to. Uh, it is time consuming when estimation is not instant. Uh, fitting k times can become unfeasible. Even k is uh, five to ten. It can be unstable. Imagine doing cross validation on many different samples. Um, there can be large variability on the model chosen. Still, some form of cross validation is used in most uh, data manage. Uh, what, what's that? Uh, data science and machine learning applications. Um, also, we caref uh, be careful not to cheat, for, for example, with the uh, FDR, false discovery rate cut model, uh, cut model, right? 25 variables in the semiconductor regression. We've already used the full N observations to select the 25 strongest variables. It is not surprising they do well in out of sample test. Um, the rules, if you do something to the data, do it inside cross-validation, okay? Um, and then, alternative to cross-validation is information criteria. Akaike information criteria, or corrected version of it, or base information criteria uh, is there. You want to minimize this guy, okay? Um, these approximate um, distance between uh, model and the truth, right, and the truth, you can apply them by choosing the model with minimum information criteria, right? It's a distance measure, okay? You want a minimum distance. Again, most common is Akaike's information criteria, which is deviance plus two times de uh, degree of freedom. And this degree of freedom uh, is used in your model fit. Um, for lasso MLE, this is just a number of non-zero beta hats, right? For example, the summary GLM outputs report, reports like this, right? Um, and then null deviance and residual deviance like that. AIC is 651.04. Uh, and many recommend uh, picking the model with the smallest AIC. Uh, note the degree of freedom in our put out uh, output is uh, degrees of freedom left after fit, like n minus df. Okay, that we are talking about. Uh, so don't get confused. Anyway, uh, and then AIC overfits in high dimensions is a concern. AIC is actually estimating out of sample deviance. What your deviance would be on another in, in, uh, independent sample. Um, of size, okay, n, okay. Um, independent sample deviance is too small, right? Um, since the model is tuned to this data, uh, some deep uh, theory shows that IS out of sample, uh, independent sample out of sample deviance goes to, right? IS minus OOS deviance converges to two uh, times degrees of freedom. Um, so AIC will be um, converging to out of, uh, out of sample deviance. It is common to claim this approximation is good, to, uh, good for big N. Actually, it's only good for big N divided by degrees of freedom. In big data, degrees of freedom or number of parameters can be huge. Often, uh, degrees of freedom um, goes to n, right, big number. Uh, in this case, the AIC will be bad approximation. It overfits, okay? So there is a concern about overfitting for AIC, original one. So there is a correction, corrected version of a something called AICC. Um, AIC approximates out-of-sample uh, deviance, but does a bad job for big uh, 
degrees of freedom, big data, big number of columns. In linear regression, an um, improved approximation to out of sample deviance is AICC deviance plus two times degrees of freedom, okay, times expected value of this ugly term, which is a ratio of sigma squared divided by sigma squared hat, okay. Um, I'm not going to ask you about this one, but easily put this as deviance plus two times degrees of freedom times n over n minus degrees of freedom minus one. This is the core corrected AIC or AICC. It also works nicely in logistic regression for any uh, GLM. Um, note that for big uh, n over degrees of freedom, uh, AICC will converge to AIC. Okay. Uh, so always use AICC, right? Now that's one message. Uh, GAML uses uh, AICC, and that's the point that you see over there in the dashed line. It mark it's marked on the path plot over here, the point of lambda where AICC is minimized, right? Uh, and it is the default for quef dot GAMLR and Big B, okay, or this code, you will, you're going to see it, right? So that, uh, right, those coefficients are kept like this. Now, another option is Bayes information criteria. And Bayes information criteria, or BIC, right, is deviance plus log of n times degrees of freedom. This looks just like AIC, but it comes from a very different place. BIC is almost equal to this minus log of probability of M sub B uh, given data. The probability that model B is true given the data. Okay? Um, this probability actually is a posterior probability. Okay? Posterior probability uh, like this. And then it is close to likelihood of function times criteria. And that is, you know, proportional to, let's say, proportional to the likelihood function times the prior. The prior is your probability that a model is true before you saw any data, subjective probability. And then BIC uses a multi-info prior like that, okay? And this prior is normally distributed with this, right? Beta coefficient should be... Uh, uh, normally distributed with mean of beta hat and then the variance being like this, okay? And then AICC tries to approximate out of sample deviance. BIC is trying to get at the truth, right? So Bayesian approach is there, but it's too conservative if you try it in the uh, lasso kind of things. Okay, ICNCB. Okay, the com score data, if you apply it in that data set, the um, log lambda is shown over here with this mean squared error. Where is it minimized? You saw it minimum, uh, minimum mean squared error, and then one standard error from that. More conservative choices over here. Uh, when it comes to AIC and BIC rule, right? Um, the IC divided by N value is shown over here in the vertical axis where your log lambda is shown commonly just like before over here. And then the minimum point of this information criteria are shown. AIC, AICC, yellow and black one. And then uh, what do you see? The BIC, much more conservative. Uh, AICC curve looks like a CV curve over here cross-validation curve, and then in practice, uh, BIC works more like LSC, uh, one standard error, CB rule, okay? BIC works more like this, one standard error rule, right? Well, it's close to the minus three, close to minus three, like that, okay? Much more conservative. But with big N, it chooses two simple model. It underfits BIC can be too conservative so that it may end up, you may end up underfitting the model. So that's the message over here. Uh, ICN cross-validation on the ComScore data. Uh, the textbook shows this kind of path graph, right? 
um, cross validation minimum cross validation one standard error away from the mean minimum is shown over here purple and then navy blue like this right and AIC C which is black and AIC over there and BIC over here right much more conservative BIC with all these selection rules you get a range of answers if you have time do CB dot okay cross validation but AICC is fast and stable and then if you are worried about the false discovery well tend towards BIC false discovery if you are uh, yeah uh, and then you know reject and then treat as garbages right lasso path uh, plot for semiconductor regression if you try it you will look like it will look like this um, big penalty to small penalty starting from the right to the left uh, log lambda and then coefficients of beta will show like this okay and then that's the end of our uh, discussion for this week all right thanks for watching